looking, looking, gets it into Steph. Three seconds left with Washington in his face. Off the ball to beat the buzzers. Clay Thompson from the corner, and he missed it. Off the front rim, well defended by Dallas, and the Mavericks win 108-106. It's time for Warriors Wrap-Up. We'll bring you into the locker room and hear from Coach Kerr and the players. Highlights from the game, Warriors Wrap-Up starts now. Yeah, an appropriate photo finish in Dallas. Kevin Dad on the call there here on 95.7 The Game. This is Warriors Wrap-Up. My name is Evan Giddings. As the Warriors fall by just a bucket, a Clay Thompson potential game winner short came down to the wire, the final possession, one last look for the Dubs. They fought back but fell short in Dallas, snapping a six-game win streak, snapping their road magic that they have conjured up down the stretch of this season. And again, they fall 108-106 to to the Dallas Mavericks. No Luka Doncic tonight for Dallas, but no Andrew Wiggins and no Jonathan Kaminga for the Golden State Warriors. Steph Curry, 14 fourth quarter points. Clay Thompson with a couple of misplays down the stretch, but Chris Paul is fantastic in this game. A lot to dig into, as I thought we saw per- perhaps a play in energy type of preview tonight from the Golden State Warriors because I saw a fight, I saw physicality, I saw toughness, I saw a game in which the Warriors came out a little flat but then steadied the ship to the point where they were down 16 but then led by the end of the first quarter. We're up by two going into the half. It was a jockeying type of battle, a seesaw affair between the Warriors and a team that right now is as hot as any in the NBA as the Mavericks win in fact their 13th of their last 15 games and of course one of those two losses was on Tuesday also in close fashion by four points to these very Warriors. So, an interesting one in Dallas. I think a decent amount to pull from in this game, and I look forward to breaking it down with you here on Warriors Wrap-Up on 95.7 The Game. The number is 888-957-9570. I'm also curious what you, the fans out there, feel like this game represented, what it meant, what you pulled from this, what you took away from watching a game that I thought was a hell of a basketball game. Just one, of course, in which the Warriors did not win. Did it make you feel like there was some staying power from the six-game road trip? That defensively they could measure up with a team that they did also on Tuesday? Or the fact that they just went one-on-one against a team you won at home, they won on the road, and you might have a chance to beat that kind of team in the play-in, in the playoffs? I know they might not face the Dallas Mavericks, but also a big part of this game for me, too, was a little bit as great of a an, an effort as it was. And as much as I thought Steph flipped the script from a, a relatively poor first half to a great second half and a great fourth quarter, as much as I felt like the Warriors got contributions from everywhere in the second unit, Chris Paul, but also Brandon Pajemski, I thought was really good in this game. Gary Payton II went 6 of 7 and was a plus off the bench. Even Kevon Looney was able to contribute for 10 minutes I did feel like, in some sense, this was a little bit of a missed opportunity for Golden State. And when you look at the big picture, here's why. The Warriors are still in 10th place right now. Now, they've won you know, six of their last seven. They're still relatively hot. They're still a 42-win team with the final five games left to play. They still got a lot of games left in front of them. You look at Sunday at home against Utah, the Lakers next Tuesday, then a back-to-back, and then you finish up on Sunday. So you got opportunities to still climb your way potentially out of the 10 seed. But this game does make that a little bleak because you're now 42 and 35. You are essentially, or pardon me, 42 and 34. You're one and a half games right now behind, or two games behind the Los Angeles Lakers and the Sacramento Kings. Three games behind the New Orleans Pelicans. I guess the the Suns right now could be three and a, three behind you, or three in front of you, but they're playing right now currently. I look at this game a little bit as a missed opportunity for the Warriors from their play in push perspective. They had done so much work over the last week and a half, beginning in Miami on the road. They win the last four of that road trip. They take the game against Dallas at home at Chase Center. They win in Houston yesterday. And in what is an excruciatingly taxing tail end of a back-to-back against a physical, really good Dallas Mavericks team that's been playing perhaps their best this season, the Warriors saw around the league the Kings lose in Boston after losing last night in New York. The Pelicans have now waned. They've lost four games in a row. And the Lakers are still two games in front of you. In fact, if you want to even look behind you, 
The Houston Rockets also lost tonight, their fourth consecutive defeat. Their tragic number is down to one, which means the Warriors' magic number securing the 10th seed at the least was down to one. They could have gotten that tonight. They did not. From that perspective, I feel like this game was a missed opportunity. In the macro, a missed opportunity to gain some ground and give yourself a legitimate shot to pull out of even the 10 and 9 seed area. You look at Sacramento. That's a catchable team. The Pelicans, who are reeling, look catchable. The Warriors, if they won this game tonight, and it would have taken everything they had and even more that they already gave, but that would have really given them a legitimate shot with one and a half games in this situation, or one game back of nine in the eight seed, to make a push at the seven and eight and get out of the nine and ten game. That, to me, is why that loss hurts tonight more than anything else. And I know it was in a, a back-and-forth game, but we could just go through that last five minutes because I thought there was some really good basketball in Dallas played tonight. You know, they the Warriors were down by nine points, 101-92 with four minutes and 51 seconds left. Pajemski brings it down after getting a, a turnover on P.J. Washington and gives it right back. Washington steps into a straightaway three at the 432 mark and makes it a nine-point game. And then from there, you just look at some of the key plays, some of the misses. Kyrie, a 12-foot miss pull-up. Chris Paul's rebound. Alex to Curry, who drives to the free-throw line and gets to two to cut it to five. And then Daniel Gafford looked undeniable underneath to make it a seven-point game. Curry air balls. Draymond had an open three. He missed it. And then Curry, I just I felt like he had enough. He conjured up enough for the tail end of that game, but he needed one more play because of the Excellent and, and just wizard-like performance in the fourth quarter by Kyrie Irving. Whether he was scoring, whether he was setting up his teammates, I thought Kyrie was fantastic in this basketball game, who, by the way, played a game-high 42 minutes. And oddly enough, has played, I think, his 26 or maybe probably 28 straight games. It's the longest that Kyrie has played since all the way back in 2016. So he's playing some good basketball as well. But with Dallas being down their big dog in Doncic, they needed Kyrie, and he came up with just, unfortunately for the Warriors, one more play than Curry did. And that play was a pass. In the final possession of that game, you look at Curry, who hits a miraculous, a, a deep, uh, they said it was 28 feet, that had to be 30-plus. A 30-foot three-pointer from straightaway with 58.7 seconds left as Draymond sets a, a wall type of screen on, on Jones Jr. That makes it a one-point game. And then they get another look 20 seconds later, Curry misses a step back three for the lead with 31.1. And then may, perhaps the call that I thought could have switched the game. In real time, I thought P.J. Washington, who had a leak out, barreled into Curry. Real time, I thought it was a charge. Turned out that Curry had his heel just on the edge of the restricted area. Upon review, after the Warriors challenge, it was unsuccessful. Did appear to be the right call, in my opinion, as his heel was in the restricted area. But P.J. Washington only makes one free throw. That makes it a two-point game. And then Curry to step back from the short corner on the left side. Clutch basket by the chef with 12.4 seconds left. to Tied at 106. And then that's where Curry, or pardon me, Kyrie, made the final play, which was getting doubled on the outside, swinging it to Hardaway. Hardaway blows past Clay and dumps it off for an easy basket to P.J. Washington to give the Mavericks their eventual 108-106 to final and win it was a great basketball game and one that kind of had the makings i think of a playoff atmosphere and there's been a lot of playoff type atmospheres around the nba i think because number one of how the referees are calling some of these games whether you feel like they're in the warriors or curry's favor particularly or not i think they've made for some very physical basketball and it just feels to me more like postseason than actual regular season basketball and so that's what I, I enjoyed a lot about this game tonight is the physicality between these two teams. And it's interesting because with Luka and Kyrie, I know Luka was out tonight, and we'll get to the Warriors and their missing wings in a moment. But with Luka out, you know, you're looking around Dallas and they don't really have a lot of shot makers. And I think it highlights just how physical and defensively driven they have been in many ways. How they've been able to win, now 13 of their last 15, is how the Warriors have been able to go on their 6 of 7 run. And I thought what they also did with their 14 and 4 stretch in the month of February, which is, even though they have staff, even though they have Clay, uh, to some extent earlier, about a month ago, you know, Kaminga was scoring a lot. The Warriors' path to victory to me is through their defense. And while they didn't hold up 
in particular moments tonight, I thought overall played very well. Trace Jackson Davis had a little bit of a tough night, though he, I thought he had a few moments. Moses Moody on the defensive end uh, was getting taken advantage of, especially early on in that basketball game when the Warriors fell down 16 right out of the gates. But overall, I thought their defense competed. And what you saw tonight in the second straight week, they playing a back-to-back, this time on the road, just as they did last year, uh, last week, picking up a huge win against Orlando. Um, the Warriors had to dig deep. And I thought that they showed by, you look at the minute total, and you look at how many players played in this game, partially because of necessity. But it was essentially eight-and-a-half-man rotation. Draymond played 34 minutes. Curry was almost at 36 minutes in this game. Klay Thompson played 30, 33 minutes. Chris Paul, who, by the way, only last night played 20 minutes and has been around the 20-minute mark for this team, he played 31 minutes in this game, and I thought he was really, really good. Pajemski, 25. Gary Payton, who usually is in the 15-minute range, he played 24 tonight. So everyone had to play up in a game that was a back-to-back, in which you typically see players, and in fact, I I saw some people commenting on this on social media, the fact that when the Warriors went down so big so early that you almost wondered if they had enough legs to get back into this game. They proved that very quickly that they did. I thought the Mavericks came out with energy. I thought the Warriors came out flat until the second unit flipped the script of that game and allowed the rest of the team to move into a rhythm. And in the second half, I thought Curry was very good. Draymond Green also solid in the second half, but Chris Paul, Gary Payton the second, and Brandon Pajemski, particularly GP2 and Chris Paul, I thought made a lot of winning plays tonight, and that to me is the reason why they found themselves in a position with the ball to win the game, tie or go to overtime, or win the game, and unfortunately they could not. Final score 108 to 106 in Dallas. So the final score is that. 888-957-9570 is the number. Evan Giddings with you on Warriors wrap up here on 957 the game what's going on to everyone on the YouTube chat powered by First NorCal Credit Union on the Twitch chat as well what's going on I see y'all filing in here uh again the number is 888-957-9570 that is also the number for the Comcast business text line uh yes this was from earlier but we did we did see that Luka didn't even play in this game but the Warriors also didn't have their wings and that was another big takeaway from this game too sometimes you know you, you look at the absences in particular contests, and it points to really where, where you, I don't know, get a look at just how important players are or types of players. Like to me, again, hearkening back to the theme of this feeling like the postseason or having the physicality of a playoff game or a play in game, which is where the Warriors are, are pretty much headed to at this point because they didn't win. Um, you need wings. Like you, you just do. You need two-way in particular, but you need wings to compete. I felt like the absence of both Andrew Wiggins, who's been playing very well as of late, and then Jonathan Kaminga, who was supposed to be back last night against Houston, I guess had warmed up before this game tonight in the absence of Wiggins, but was not able to go and has now missed six straight games. Both of those players, to me, were missed, and it's because of what they can do looking at how the Mavericks came out at the beginning of that first quarter. I thought the Mavericks were quicker. I thought they were faster. I thought they looked more athletic. And I thought they took advantage of a Warriors team that, although you had Moody starting in that game, he did not play very well tonight. And so the one wing that you were kind of reliant upon to play well, to have a good game, was getting taken advantage of. And so I thought the absence of Wiggins and Kaminga were huge in this game. Interestingly enough, though, you look at the Mavericks, and I'm not saying I don't believe that they're better like without Luka Doncic. I mean, he's he's a top five MVP MVP candidate. He's lead the league in scoring. Um, I think since the beginning or midway through January, he's averaging like 33 tenants. He's averaging a triple double pretty much. So they're not better without him. But in this type of game, with the Warriors being down both of their wings, it's almost as if Dallas I think benefited a bit from not having someone that keeps the pace at his own, being Luka Doncic. The game always the, the game's tempo gravitates around Luka because generally, even when even with Steph on the floor, sometimes he can take over. He he might look like the best player on the floor with Steph and Curry on it. So the game is going to gravitate towards his tempo. He likes to play a little slower. He'll go one-on-one. He'll get his. 
He'll set up his teammates and allow his others to play defense. I thought because Luka was not in this game, and with Kyrie able to shoulder the load across 42 minutes, they in a way were better equipped to play against these Warriors who were down both of their wings because they could use their athleticism, because they could get up and move down the court. P.J. Washington was much better in this game than he was on Tuesday. Someone like Dante Exum, I thought, played much better in this game than he did on Tuesday. I mean, for crying out loud, Derek Jones Jr. looked like defensively a stud at times in this game and was able to, I thought, play a little more physically because Doncic was not out there. So they were a much more defensively driven group, the Dallas Maverick Roar tonight, and they have looked very good defensively over the last you know, 20 games. But without Doncic, combined with Wiggins and Kaminga not being out there, in a way, it's almost as if the De- the Mavericks were able to morph into something that was better suited to play against these Warriors or their iteration of them tonight. Um, kind of going through some of the, the, the keys you know, to the game, at least before, I thought they the Warriors had to make three point shots. They only went twelve of thirty five from deep, thirty four percent. They took relatively good care of the basketball outside of inopportune moments, and of course in the first half. You know, for for those saying that the Warriors came out flat and that kind of did them in, I, I don't necessarily subscribe to that. Yes, they went down sixteen about midway through that first quarter, but they also led at the end of the first. And I thought a big reason for that was Chris Paul. Chris Paul put on a freaking masterclass in that first half. He was a plus 25, but what he did, and I thought what the Warriors around him were able to do, which basically put them in a position to win this game, they closed the first, the second, and third quarters extremely well. In the first quarter, the final three minutes. In the second quarter, the last two minutes. And in the third quarter, the final minute. I thought Chris Paul was a huge part of that because you saw... Kerr have to rely on him a little more with Curry not playing as well early in this game. Clay Thompson not shooting it necessarily well early in this game. And also, someone like Moses Moody, who didn't have it, you had to keep the Splash Brothers out there, but that third, I don't know, kind of swing player inside of Draymond Green and TJD or another big Kavon Looney also got time at the five tonight. You needed a third player out there that was going to be a plus. And so I think that's also a reason why we saw Chris Paul start out of the half instead of Moses Moody. So he was really good in this game. I thought he controlled the tempo a bit, which also helped the Warriors dig back quickly into this game. And I'm curious what people think about overall the takeaway from the Warriors' 108-106 to 106 defeat in Dallas to the Mavericks. They go 1-1 one one this week with Dallas. They now won six of their last seven. They snap a season-long six-game winning streak. And they are now 42-35, and 35, unfortunately still two games behind the ninth seed, now tied between the Lakers and and the Kings. Evan Giddings with you on Warriors wrap up. The number is 888-957-9570. Let's get out to Zach in Santa Rosa. Uh, this is a take that I, I wasn't necessarily expecting, but Zach, what's going on, my man? How are you doing? What's up, man? I appreciate you having me on. Um, I've been a pretty big advocate for Kerr getting fired pretty much all year and okay. even before this season. And um, I mean, I, I just stuck with this all year, and, and it never, it never fails, it never fails me because every time, every game, it's like my biggest takeaway from tonight about Steve Kerr is after when we have a final possession, when we have to take the final shot. Every time he has no idea what to do, and it's the same play every time. It's either get the ball to Steph like 10 feet behind the three-point line and either rely on him to just heave up a prayer or he gets double teamed and last second has to dish it to someone else who has like half a second to shoot a three or a contested three or anything. It's like I, I just don't understand why he can't figure out that that never, ever works. So whenever it comes to it, at the end of a game, if the Warriors have the final shot, I fully expect us to lose. Not because I don't believe in if Steph's not clutch, because Steph, I, I mean, that's a stupid narrative to say Steph's not clutch, but it's the fact that Steve Kerr cannot draw anything up for these guys to succeed in the final seconds of a game. I could say more about Kerr, but that was my takeaway from tonight. Interesting. Okay. I appreciate that, Zach. Yeah, I mean, we, we can zero on that last play if you want. Um because there was also something, so Sterling Bennett, our, our network program, was kind of coming out during, uh, what was it, the, the second to last time out, Sterling? Yeah, and so we were just talking about how, look, Dallas is in the bonus, and the Warriors were taking a lot of three-point shots, particularly Curry. I mean, just look at the last minute, right? Well, actually, the last two and a half minutes, because at the two and a half mark, Curry airballed a three, 
Uh, I thought he shot it. Didn't really have a lot of legs. Jones had blocked a three from Curry. Uh, I think it was a minute beforehand. But then, with a minute left, I mean, he he just draws, I don't know, an extra level of energy within himself to hit the three-pointer to draw within one. He missed the three with 30 seconds left and then took a step back, a fadeaway, which he drained with 12.4. And that final look, I, I, I don't know about you, Zach, and everyone out there, I, I just don't think the Mavericks were going to let him shoot that ball. Like, I, either he was going to take it from 35 feet and it was going to be a not-so-great look, or the Warriors were, I, I guess, going to win that game. I felt like, number one, they were going for the three. That was a team on the tail end of a back-to-back that had expended itself, that had zero, zero interest in playing an extra five minutes on the road, and they were going to take three. Do you want Kerr to take that shot? Yes. Do you want Kerr to draw up something that's going to get Curry open? Ideally, but he was never going to get that look. It's the same reason why with, uh, what was it, 12.4 seconds left after Curry ties the game, you know exactly where the ball is going to go. The entire arena knows that Dallas is going to give the ball to Kyrie Irving. And who took the final shot for Dallas? P.J. Washington. You know why? Because Kyrie was immediately doubled the moment he stepped across half court. Because the moment he got the ball at 35 feet, Chris Paul and Curry were on him. He had to give that ball up. And if anything, on the final defensive possession, if you're talking about, I don't know about blame, um, but but the guy who who I guess you could look at in this situation is unfortunately Clay because he's on both ends of that final possession. I'm not saying it's his fault. He's the reason why. He's also a reason why they were in that game in the first place. But unfortunately, Clay gets picked on on the final possession by Dallas where Tim Hardaway gets the ball from Kyrie off of a double, beats him off the dribble quickly, defense has to collapse in the paint, and then P.J. Washington is wide open for an easy lay-in to put them up with four seconds left. And then, on the other side of the court, Curry, who, by the way, fumbled the ball out out of the inbounds, had to give it up because he wasn't going to get a good look off. He tried to free himself momentarily. He's not going around Jones. He hadn't been able to do it all game in that fourth quarter. He gives it up to Chris Paul, who makes the right play, goes into the corner to Clay, and that's not an easy shot by any means, but that's a three-pointer that Clay Thompson is able to make, and it's for the win. I I think that's as good of a a play as you can get out of something that was basically nothing at one point. So while Steve Kerr is probably going to take some some heat, you know, there are a couple decisions throughout this game that I guess he, he could have made that, I don't know, might have helped them a little more. You know, Moses Moody may have played too much in this game, uh, even though he got 27 minutes, he was a minus 23. You know, Trace Jackson Davis looked like a, a rookie at this game. You know, those two players are young and they had a bad game. That That's going to happen. Unfortunately, when you're a minus 23 and TJD's a minus 26 and you lose by two, that's going to stand out. Is that on Kerr? Maybe so. I would lean not. But that last play, I cannot in any way, shape, or form put on Steve Kerr because you just saw the play before what happens when everyone knows who the ball is going to go to, they're not going to get a shot. Kyrie Irving is not going to get that final shot because everyone in the building knows that he's going to get it, and that's the man you're most fearful of. Who's the person you're most fearful of on the Warriors? Steph Curry. Now, as for the Warriors taking a lot of threes down the stretch of this game, uh, number one, I, I think that's been pretty consistent with who, with who they've been, whether they've been up or down. And I think a big reason, maybe the first half of the season, we continuously went in this cycle of, well, how come the Warriors are blowing these big leads? How come they can't, you know, keep hold of a of a twelve plus point lead, which they've blown on it now like eight times or something like that? And I think it's because they get tired. And what's the easy alternative when you're tired? It's to take a jump shot. It's harder to take it to the rack. It's harder to leap and to take contact. It's easier to hoist. So. You know, I, I think the, what the Warriors might look at now, and maybe people are wondering, is well, do you essentially, as the ten seed in this situation, try and rest? Do you try and conserve your energy, and do you try and basically get to the point where you are feeling as close to one hundred percent as possible for the play-in? I don't think that's how they approach it yet, but I think that this loss unfortunately makes that path a little more viable. Because if you had won this game, and again, that's why I would describe tonight, as much as it was you know, a photo finish and a physical game and a really good effort from the Warriors, it was also a missed opportunity. 
You could have been within a game of the Lakers and the Kings. You could have been within two games of the seven seed. Heck, if Phoenix loses in a little bit, you could you could have been within two games of the six seed. So the Warriors missed an opportunity to pick up a big win tonight, and it was a hard one to get, but it is a missed opportunity nonetheless from the play-in or play-off perspective if you broaden things. You know, I, I think the other obvious takeaway from this game is you just you just missed your wings. Something we were as a station tossing around a lot throughout this week was, well, is it Wiggins? Well, is it Kaminga? Uh, is it, it, it to me? You miss both of them. I'm sorry, you just miss both of them. Now, does that mean that the Warriors might, when Kaminga is ready and Wiggins is also healthy, and he rolled his ankle late against Houston? You hope he's back on Sunday at Chase Center against the Jazz. But if both of them are healthy, yeah, there might have to be a, a, a conversation or a discussion about who starts and who doesn't. And I actually look forward to digging into this deeper uh, tomorrow morning from 9 a.m. to noon on Warriors this week with my guy Dan Devone. But I don't think it's just about, okay, who needs to start? Who needs to do this? To me, the Warriors, if there was anything you could pull, for, especially from the beginning of this game when they went down 16 points, is they need both Wiggins and Kaminga. Whether you think that they're redundant, which I do feel like sometimes there's a bit of overlap between their games, sometimes the ball sticks, they need both of them. Whether it's on the floor, staggering them, they need both of their requisite skill sets because there just aren't players like you saw tonight. As great as Moses Moody has been as a fill-in, as Mr. Stay Ready as he has been, I'm not sure if he's ready to do that consistently enough for the Warriors to play high-level basketball against teams like Dallas, which they will have to play eventually when they move forward. They got a, a, a team on Tuesday in the Lakers. They're going to need both Wiggins and Kaminga for that game. If they had Wiggins and Kaminga tonight, I think the Warriors beat Dallas. Now, you could say, oh, well, the Mavericks are missing their best player. They're missing Doncic. Uh, they also had a secondary option, and that was something that also stood out to me from this game, is that if Doncic misses a game for the Mavericks, they're not dead in the water. Conversely, if Kyrie Irving misses a game that Doncic plays, the Mavericks are not dead in the water. You also you look at the Warriors. If Steph doesn't play in this game, if he does not play, they're generally mostly dead in the water. I think the Warriors are 1-5 and when Curry misses games this year. That's not the case with Doncic. That's not the case with Irving. The Mavericks have multiple stars and secondary options that can become number ones, and that was also a big reason why they won tonight because Kyrie, I thought, was fantastic down the stretch of this game, and he was really good throughout the entirety of the game, and he had to be. He still looked fresh even playing 42 minutes into his young and mid-30s. So, you know, I, I don't want to lay blame at Steve Kerr's feet for that final play, uh, but we can talk about the final play, what you thought should have happened if they wanted to go for two, if they should have taken a better three, how they could have gotten that look, or we can take a look at what you felt like was missing in this game overall, because to me, it was the two wings and overall led to a missed opportunity for them to climb in the Western Conference play in standings. 888-957-9570 is the number. Evan Giddings with you on words. Wrap up here on 95.7 The Game. People continuing to file in here on our YouTube and Twitch chat powered by First NorCal Credit Union. Shout out to the Comcast Business Text Line. This is from the 530 Dubs. Kick this one away, but still in position to get 8 or 9 if they finish strong. No, they are in good position to finish 8 or 9. But it would have been significantly easier to get out of the 9 or 10 play-in if you had won this game, that's what stings about it. From the 219, Warriors should have finished off Dallas with no Luka, be battling the Lakers for the eighth seed. Critical loss. We might be looking at this as a critical loss. And it sucks because, yes, they were missing Luka, but the Warriors were also missing two of their, I would say, top four or five most important players, depending on how they're playing. And especially with how Wiggins was playing, I think the Warriors win this game if they had one of them. In tonight, that's how important I believe those wings are to what this matchup eventually became. All right, let's get out to Berkeley. Talk to our guy Mark here on Warriors Wrap Up. Mark, what's up, man? How are you? Uh, I'm pretty good. Can you hear me? Yeah, I got you. What's up? Uh, I just think we should have went for a two because that's just my opinion and drawn up a play. Uh, uh, Chris Paul alley oop to the rookie or to uh, Draymond or somebody for a dunk. And, or just get it two, and then go into overtime. We had the momentum. If we had gotten into overtime, I think we would have won with our momentum mm. coming back. But I don't see this as a big loss because it was so close. 
And it's just sad that we would have picked up a game on both those guys, but uh, there's still a chance. I think we'll win the play-in anyway, so I hope. But it's, it's <laughs> sad that we we didn't pick up this game, but uh, there's no, nothing bad to say about anybody. The coach is great. It's just, it's just. Uh, I would have went for a two and went to overtime. That's, and you, you don't agree. You think that's not what we wanted to do, but uh, the percentages are are higher to get a two. I think. Gotcha. Drop. No, I, I look, Mark. I, I totally agree on on your last point. Uh, by the way, you're listening to ninety five seven. The game KGMZ FM and HD one San Francisco always live in the free Odyssey app, Twitch, and YouTube, powered by First NorCal Credit Union. I, I agree that the two percent or the the two point look would it would have been a higher percentage, and in fact, they might have got it. Um, if this was an elimination game, I do think you're right that the Warriors would have explored a two point shot. But in this situation, I think it, it it just made sense to me to go for the home run ball. And while that may be a lower percentage look, look, you're you're on the tail end of a back to back. You're finishing up. You know what? What a stretch of six of seven on the road. Um, you've already expended Curry thirty six minutes again in a back to back. You've played only eight players. A lot of them had to play taxing and heavy minutes. You could tell guys out there were gassed. I didn't think there was any doubt that they were going for three. It's almost like you see in baseball sometimes when games get into the the eleventh or or twelfth inning. Sometimes if you just look at the schedule, it dictates which reliever you're going to see coming out of the bullpen. And not that a reliever is is equated, you know, equated to the decision, but like when you see the I don't know, the, the Giants throw their their sixth arm out of the bullpen in the 12th inning, it's not that they don't want to win that game, but it's like we got to get this game over with because we've already played too much baseball or we're, we're, we're throwing too many pitches, we're throwing too many arms. We're going to win or lose right here. And I thought the Warriors just decided they were going to win or lose right there. And we've also seen them make that choice a lot of times this year because when you have an older group, I, like they might have had momentum going into overtime, Mark, but I, I also think that they may have been more gassed. I, like against the Lakers earlier this year in double overtime, we saw them conjure up, you know, that second and third and fourth gear. But you, you also got to look at what you got ahead of you, which is still. You know, games left in which that are winnable for the Warriors, but also still kind of congested. I don't know if all of that is still in front of the Warriors, but you got five games left in eight days beginning on Sunday because you're at home against Utah, then you go to the Lakers, then you go to Portland, you come home for a back-to-back, and you finish up at home on Sunday with Utah. Uh, I I think part of that is the schedule game, and that's why they decided to take that shot. So it, it, I think we, we kind of uh, agree on... on the, the two-point strategy being the most viable option for a bucket. But in the grand scheme of things, I, I just don't think the Warriors were ever going to take anything less than a three. And the reason being the fact that they were just completely taxed. So I appreciate you calling in. 888-957-9570 is the number. Evan Giddings with you on Warriors Wrap-Up. Uh, it, it's interesting when you kind of look at like the hardest worker of this game, which, by the way, is brought to you by uh, by the Alameda County Sheriff's Office, who works hard to serve the community. If you're looking for a career in law enforcement, learn more about job opportunities at joinacso.com. To me, I, I actually kind of felt like the hardest worker in this game was was Kerry Payton II. Uh, that guy made a ton of big-time plays throughout this game, whether he was guarding Kyrie, who he was matched up on down the stretch of this game, um, he had a couple of big steals, or he had a, had a steal, but a couple of big blocks, one of which on Gafford right before he went up and stuffed it with under three minutes left in the game. Uh, but GP2 hit a big corner three in the fourth quarter. He was 6 of 7 from the floor, gave him 14 points off the bench, and was also part of a bench mob that I think in the first quarter went 7 of 7 from the floor and was a major reason that they got back into this game. I thought overall, look, the, the best player by the end of the game was was obviously Curry. And he scored half of his 28 points in the fourth quarter. But perhaps the most important player to get the Warriors in a position to win might have been Chris Paul. I thought he just controlled the flow of this game. He had four steals, by the way, in the first half alone. Ended up with only nine points, and he scored seven of which in the first half. But he had a big three at the tail end of the first quarter, along with a fadeaway bucket right before. Uh, he had eight assists in this game, though he did have three turnovers, as well as five rebounds. 
So the the second unit continues to pull its weight, and, and that was also something that, I mean, it's been a constant throughout this season. You know, the the bench being fantastic, but they just dragged them into the point where again we're looking at the starters. You know, coming out a little bit flat. And part of that was the back-to-back. It was the amount of games that they've played. Part of it's probably age as well. Um, but there has to be some sort of, I don't know, just just more urgency at the beginning of these games. I think that's also a place where Kaminga as well as Wiggins could have helped, whether it's Kaminga off the bench or, you know, Wiggins. I don't know. We've gone back and forth about it, and we'll continue to do so. Um, but the, the flatness at the beginning of this game, you know, to me, I think highlighted just... I don't know where the Warriors continue to be at, which is older, um, and they need time to to get themselves revved up. I think they need time to to get themselves into these games because, like Curry did all he could. It was just the Mavericks ended up making one more play, and and again, you know, I'm looking at Luca being out, Kyrie being in. You know, the, the Mavericks needed essentially one guy, even though PJ Washington was really good in this game. Um, they needed one guy to take it home, and and they have two of them on their roster, you know. So looking, it, it just kind of, I don't know. Throughout my brain, the entire game was just swirling around this idea of, well, damn, you know, if if Curry had some sort of running mate that can take some pressure off of him, whether it's on particular possessions, for stretches, for even games entirely, uh, that would be a massive asset for Golden State. And I'm just not sure that they're going to be able to do it. But you know, Kyrie tonight in 42 minutes and 29, eight and seven. I thought the Warriors did a pretty good job of doubling him. But even then, he made the correct decisions and hurt him, especially in the final minutes and on that final uh, made shot by, by P.J. Washington. But that was his that was his running mate tonight, uh, P- P.J. Washington, who also, by the way, you know, like looking at the Mavericks and the decisions that they made at the trade deadline also put them in a position to win a game like this. And I'm not saying the Warriors made the wrong choice at the deadline because I think a lot of people looked at them as sellers. But you look at some of the the two like the two players outside of Kyrie that were, I don't know, the most important or the most physically bruising in this game. There were there were two wings or a wing and a and a center. But PJ Washington, who had 32 points, was 12 of 18, hit five threes, five steals and two blocks, by the way. But also Daniel Gafford. Both of those players they acquired at the deadline. Like the, the Mavericks went out and got some reinforcements. Not only were they missing Doncic, they're also missing their their nineteen year old rookie Derek Lively, who's been really good for them. They missed him on Tuesday also. Uh, but that's where your assets or your additions and the added depth were a necessity for them, and really have been a necessity during this thirteen and two stretch over their last fifteen games. But Washington, they traded for him. He played forty minutes tonight. Gafford played 31 minutes. He had three blocks and 15 rebounds. Four of them offensive. He had 10, but he had a double double tonight. Um, you know, so so the Mavericks made some choices throughout this season that I felt like the Warriors were not in a position to as potential sellers, and instead they just looked at themselves at the trade deadline with a couple of guys coming back. Chris Paul, I think at the time Moses Moody was also out. So was GP two. They looked at their trade deadline additions as basically just being internal, where the Dallas Mavericks identified players they had to move or were going to move off of, i.e. Rashawn Holmes, as well as Grant Williams, and they were able to turn those into productive players that on a night like tonight, in addition to someone like Kyrie who led the way, were fantastic and were a big part of why they beat the Warriors, again, by a final score of 108 to 106. 888-957-9570 is the number. Evan Giddings with you on Warriors Wrap-Up. And uh, that is the number also for the Comcast business text line. I'm, I'm kind of with you. Zico won in the YouTube chat powered by First NorCal Credit Union. Considering the Dubs are missing two key players, they played as well as can be expected, minus the sloppy turnovers. Yeah, they ended up having 15 of them tonight. Uh, that was a theme from the Houston game that unfortunately carried over a little bit. What, they had 10 turnovers in the first quarter against Houston? Uh, in fact, that was a, really the only reason that the Rockets were in that game for as long as they were. But you know that that kind of carried over. I thought Chris Paul in general did a pretty good job of steadying them down, allowing Curry to play off the ball. Um, you know, looking at here, you know, I, I think the, a lot of the sentiment from people chiming in is that it was a good effort, but a missed opportunity. And I I, I forget who said it. It was I think a really good 
um, observation. You know, basically the the theme of the season it has been missed opportunities. I would also ask blown up. I would also add blown opportunities just from you know the the leads that they've had. Uh, this is from the five five one. Warriors got job tonight. I don't. I don't think they got job, my man or woman. Uh, they'll bounce back and start another win streak in, into the play in. Well, that's okay. So that's that, that. That's something I. I think we need to. I think we need to discuss because I believe this game was a missed opportunity, given who lost in front of you, i.e. the Pelicans, i.e. the Kings, and then of course the Rockets behind you. So you had a chance to essentially sink uh, sink yourself into the ten, but. With the loss tonight, it does look with five games left, two games back, and you not having the tiebreaker over Sacramento because of the division record, you still could get the tiebreaker over the Lakers, but you got to win on Tuesday. I do wonder if the Warriors put it into a little more of a cruise control mode, understanding that two games has been really hard to overcome. I mean, it feels like they've been either one and a half or two or two and a half games back of the Lakers for like the last two weeks, and they've rattled off six of seven, and they're still in the same place because the Lakers themselves have also been winning games. I wonder now how people are viewing the Warriors as essentially a 10-seed basketball team, knowing that they're going to probably have to go on the road twice and win two elimination games. Do you think that the Warriors should just try and manage these games, manage Curry's minutes, Manage Clay's minutes, manage Dre's minutes, use their depth. Ideally, you get Wiggins back. And I know that him and Kaminga's absence is a big reason why the guys played big minutes tonight. But try and manage the load of their older players a little more, beginning on Sunday against Utah. But if you do you go for that Lakers game, I mean, do you, do you go all out for that game? Do you try and win the final five and just hope that the Lakers lose a couple that Sack does? Are you still trying to push the pedal to the metal with the veterans like Steve Kerr did tonight? 888-957-9570. I think that's also something that the Warriors have to consider is how fresh they are or will be for the play-in. Because I, I think the Warriors can beat anybody, um, even on the road. Well, especially on the road. They play better on the road this year. But let's say they, they do win two play-in games and get to a first-round postseason series. Well, then you're still in the same schedule sort of scenario that you've been in for what feels like the last two weeks where you're playing game, day off, game, day off because the, the season would end next Sunday against Utah. If you're in the 10 game, you're probably playing on that Tuesday. And then if you win and you beat the 9 or you're the 9 and you beat the 10, you would go to play the loser of the 7-8 on that Thursday. And then in all likelihood... The first round series against probably the one seed or or let's say a top two seed, that would begin on Saturday. So the Warriors are not going to have much rest if they get through the play-in. Do you try and build some of that rest in at the tail end of the regular season or to continue to try and roll and try and stack wins in hopes that the teams in front of you fall off a little bit and maybe you could get to the nine? To me, rest is not worth or I should say taxing yourself is not worth the nine seed. That's another reason why tonight hurt uh, when I was, you know, just kind of conjuring up thoughts. It hurts because I believe that the Warriors could go all out, that they could push themselves and lay their foot on the gas pedal if the eight seed was in play. I'm not sure the eight seed is in play anymore because asking them to not just jump one, but two teams with five games left that are both two games ahead of you, that is a tall task. I think the best case scenario for me at this point is that the Warriors end up matching up with the Kings, who are in a little bit of a free fall now losing Malik Monk as well as Kevin Herter. They are in a bit of a free fall. My hope is that the Warriors, whether it's at the 9 or the 10, match up with the Sacramento Kings in that first game and then get an opportunity to either beat you know LeBron or... Kevin Durant, or perhaps even Zion Williamson and the Pelicans, who are right now the eighth seed in or the the seventh seed in that second elimination game. But either way, there's going to be some choices to make for the Warriors, and it's all off of the end of this loss that they took in two point fashion. Clay Thompson misses a potential game winner 
from the corner, and the Warriors fall just a little bit short, even after digging down from down nine with four and a half minutes left. They went on a flurry, primarily from Curry, but they come up short and now face a stark reality, which is they're going to have to make some tough choices about how they approach these last five games. Or perhaps you feel like I'm off base and they're just going to roll out the same way they did tonight against Dallas. Curry's going to be pushing it at 35 minutes a game. Clay's going to be up there. Draymond's going to be playing north of 30, and they're going to just basically try and expend themselves as much as possible to potentially get the 9 or maybe even the 8 seed. So 888-957-9570 is the number. And I I just do wonder also kind of where, where people are at now that the Warriors have finally fallen off from that six-game win streak. Or you maybe not taken much from this game because they didn't have Wiggins and Kaminga. Uh, the Mavericks also didn't have Luka Doncic. This is from the 949 of the Comcast Business Text Line. Uh, Golden State Warriors take care of subpar Jazz team. And that's going to be, of course, on Sunday. And then the game of the season, the Lakers in Los Angeles will decide who's the nine or the eight seed and has home court playing. Let's go. Well, I, I think that that would probably decide the nine or the ten. Uh, well, but also not necessarily. So this is also why the loss hurts tonight. If you were a game back of the Lakers going into that Tuesday game, because I'm assuming the Warriors take care of take care of uh, the jazz at home on Sunday, because Utah has been absolutely awful and they have zero incentive to win that game. Then if you were a game back of the Lakers going into Tuesday, if you do win, then you have the tiebreaker and you present yourself to push into the nine. But unfortunately, That's not the case anymore because you're still two games back. There's a scenario which the Warriors earn a tiebreaker with the Los Angeles Lakers, but are still the 10 because the Warriors could not close the gap. And that's, again, why this game, along with, I guess you could list a litany of games that they've had a chance to grab, they could not. So it's I I, I feel like the Warriors are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place, which is a a spot they've been for the majority of this post-All-Star break range where they have played significantly better basketball, but they still find themselves looking up at the rest of the Western Conference. I thought they also played really good basketball tonight, considering the circumstances. They had a great fourth quarter effort from Curry. I thought they got contributions from their bench. Outside of Moses Moody and Trace Jackson Davis, I thought players played pretty well. But where are they at now? Do you feel like the Warriors missed an opportunity tonight? Do you feel like they were missing their wings? And in what ways? How so? And also... How are you now approaching these final five games if you're the Warriors? Do you feel like rest is the most important thing? Do you feel like the nine seed is most important? Or do you feel like the Warriors can go on the road and win two elimination games? We're going to take a break and step aside be back. Also on the other side with Steve Kerr's interview, but the number is 888-957-9570. My name is Evan Giddings here on 95.7 The Game. We'll be back with more on Warriors wrap-up after this on your home for Golden State Warriors basketball, 95.7 The Game. Getting your biggest tax refund from Jackson Hewitt can lead to some spirited.
Steve Jones! 105, 104, Stephen Curry from way downtown. It's an 8-2 burst for Golden State. They trail by one, 105, 104. What a shot from Stephen Curry. His fifth made three of the game, and it couldn't come at a bigger time. Now back to Warriors Wrap Up on 95.7 The Game. Ah, the dulcet tones of Kevin Dana filling in for Tim Roy on 95.7 The Game. The Warriors unfortunately fall by two, 108 to 106 in Dallas, and they are still remaining two games from the nine seed as well as the eight seed because the Kings also lost tonight. Three games back of the seven seed in the Pelicans, five games left to play. They have the five coming up, of course, against Utah beginning on Sunday, Tuesday at the Lakers, Thursday at Portland, Friday versus New Orleans, and then Sunday versus Utah. And in fact, that win tonight might have even set up a monumental matchup if they could have gotten Tuesday, of course, not to get too far ahead of ourselves, but on Friday against the Pelicans. That put a, that could have been a, a swing game as well if the Warriors had gotten tonight. But unfortunately, they do not as Clay Thompson misses a potential game winner from the corner. As Kevin described, they clawed their way back. As many as down nine with four and a half minutes left. Curry hit a big three like you heard to shave it to one. And then he hit a step back jumper from the short corner in order to tie the game at 106. A P.J. Washington layup off a Tim Hardaway driving dish gave the Mavericks their final lead. And that was the final score, 108 to 106. But this is Warriors wrap up on 95.7 The Game. My name is Evan Giddings. Appreciate you all hanging out with me on a Friday night. Everyone in the YouTube and Twitch chat, powered by First NorCal Credit Union. Everyone who's called in so far. Anyone who wants to call in, what was your takeaway from that game? What did you see from a Warriors team that was missing both of its its wings? A Dallas Mavericks team that was missing its best player in Luka Doncic that right now looking at the standings is a game and a half out of the four seed in their own right. 47 wins for Dallas. They have won 13 of 15. The Warriors have won 6 of 7, 7 of their last 10 games and are now a 42-win team. In fact, if they rattle off three of their next five, they will officially have a better record than they did last season, which was good enough to get the sixth seed. Unfortunately, 44 wins this year is in all likelihood going to get them the 10 seed, which appears to be their most likely destination after falling in a game that would have closed the gap with not just the nine, but also the eight and potentially the seven. So a missed opportunity tonight in a hard-fought physical, I thought playoff type of atmosphere and basketball game between two teams fighting tooth and nail to try and get that W uh, but the Warriors could not as for what Steve Kerr had to say after the game here's the head coach and I'm very curious to know and hear kind of the tone from Steve Kerr because in one breath you could take it as a tough loss in which you were down two guys you could also take it as I thought Steve Kerr really really wanted that game here's what he had to say after I liked our defensive um, possession, you know, getting the ball out of Kyrie's hands. Um, we had the, the possession in a decent place, and uh, you know, Tim Hardaway made a, a hell of a pass, you know, just getting it um, over the outstretch hands of uh, a couple of guys. I think Trace was there first, and then Draymond was right behind it. He was probably an inch away from deflecting the pass out of bounds. Um, so, um, love the way our guys fought, um, hung in there, you know, down whatever we were down eight or nine with just a few minutes left and uh, our guys um, the, the level of competition and, and um, unity just the way they fought um, you know shorthanded with guys out and on, on a back to back um, you know older group of guys Steph, Clay, CP, Dre um, just amazing effort I love these guys they're, they're, they're incredible um, just didn't quite have enough tonight Oh, with the shot at the end. I'm sorry? The shot at the end. I assume you, you like that look. Uh, I haven't really gotten uh, a look at it yet on tape. Um, but, um, yeah, we were trying to clear some space for Steph up top, and they forced him out um, near half court, and they doubled, and Steph did the right thing. And um, so we got the ball out of the trap, and um, I didn't, I, I couldn't tell if Clay got it off in time. Um, but, um, you know, it's, uh, those are those are tough uh, circumstances to, to get a great look. Um, you know, and they did a good job switching everything and then 
and then taking the ball out of Steph's hands. And uh, but we got it out, and we we um, you know we had a decent look. But you know those are those are tough moments for sure. What was what was the explanation on Steph block? It looked like his heel might have been hovering over the center. Uh I didn't hear. You know, I, I I don't even know. I was busy in the timeout, so I didn't I didn't talk to the officials. Felt physical. Seemed, certainly, I'm sorry. Certainly seemed like physical, very physical. Yeah, yeah. What did you make of the yeah. level of intensity and the physicality? Of the team? Well, every, everybody can see it. You know, the game the game's changed. The NBA changed, uh, and so there's. Uh, there's there's a lot of physicality and um, you just got to play through it. So guys have to adapt to however the game is um, being officiated. And clearly uh, there was a there's a, been a big shift and uh, everyone's everyone's adapting to it. Uh, big picture, um, what do you what you make of your bench tonight and just how crucial are they going to be moving forward? Yeah, I mean, we got off to such a terrible start, and then uh, that group came off uh, off the bench and, and got us right back in it and even got the lead at the end of the first quarter. So, um, you know, Chris, Brandon, Gary, Loon, they were all um, really good and, um, you know, got the game organized and sorted out, and then it was just back and forth from there. What overall did you, I guess, think of, of how you played? I mean, how particularly the start, I mean, Gets back. Yeah. Did that start surprise you? Yeah, but um, you know, I thought I thought uh, Dallas was excellent defensively. You know, uh, Derek Jones did a great job out there. Um, they 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 did a lot of switching. Um, they disrupted some of the stuff we were trying to do, and then you know that's one of the reasons we started Chris in the second half uh, to get us more organized. When we were organized, like we were at, at the end of the first quarter, um, that translated to our defense. So I just thought we were a little frenetic early on, and uh, the game settled down when we brought Chris in, and, and he got us into a good place, and, and then connected the offense to the defense. And that was Steve Kerr after the loss. Again, 108-106 to to the Mavericks. Yeah, he hearkened on that last point about how good Chris Paul was. I'm, I'm totally with him. I thought he was masterful in that first half. He was a plus 25 in 15 minutes, and the Warriors really needed him um, throughout all points of this game. I mean, to, to steady the ship, they went down 16 extremely early, and I thought they looked old. I thought they looked like a team that had some some sea legs under them playing the, the tail end of a back-to-back and Chris Paul got him into it. I also thought uh, Gary Payton II was really good in this game. Brandon Pajemski off the bench just continued to, continues to make plays as he is, I think, settled into a role that is right for him as a rookie. Uh, unfortunately, a, a tough game for Trace Jackson Davis. I'm not sure the minus 26 was as reflective of his entire night. He made a couple of impactful plays. Like there was, a, there was a floater that Kyrie had towards Gafford at the rim in the first half, in which he cleaned out of the air. And he, he has those type of moments, and it wasn't as consistent. That's why I only played 20 minutes in this game. But I also think part of it, too, was uh, the Warriors, look, where they're always going to eventually end up is playing small, uh, especially in a play-in, even though it's a, it might be against a team like Anthony Davis. It might be a team against, uh, I don't know, Sacramento. Sacramento's a little smaller, but if they manage to match up against the Pelicans, they've got some size, Valanciunas at the five, Zion at the four. Um, the Warriors are going to eventually find themselves in a place where they want to play small. And in the second half, I think they went away from TJD because he wasn't as effective. He also got banged up a bit before the end of the first half. They might have had something to do with it as well. Uh, but also, it, Trace Jackson Davis is not a great foul shooter. And so you can't have that kind of player on the floor in crunch time as much as you would like or at the level of him impacting the game as he does at the start. And that's why the conversation that we had a lot this week about the two players that didn't play, Kaminga and Wiggins, are in one sense valuable because you need to figure out who you're going to start. And I think there is some credence to Kaminga coming off of the bench because of how good not just Wiggins has been, but in particular how good TJD is paired at the five at the start of games with Draymond at the four and allows Draymond to be fresh at the end of games. But I, I still think in regards to the closing lineup, that's the most important part of what the Warriors have and have not been able to do, which is largely either close out games or come back and win these type of close affairs like they couldn't tonight against Dallas. To me, the most ideal closing lineup for the Warriors is still Steph Curry, Clay Thompson, Jonathan Kaminga, Andrew Wiggins, and Draymond Green. Now, they started with that lineup 
before Pod stepped into it in February. But that front line, to me, down the stretch of games, is their most versatile, switchable, best lineup that they can throw out there. Against a team like Dallas, I think it would have been able to stand up against them tonight. Now, would it have been able to stand up against Dallas with Doncic in the game? I'm not sure. They also beat Dallas when Doncic played and had a big game, mind you, on Tuesday when he had a triple-double. So that conversation about those wings being able to play together, to me, is still one that needs to be kind of, I don't know, just dug into and and figured out. But unfortunately, you only have five games left, and you just hope to me that both Wiggins and Kaminga are out there on Sunday against Utah because they have to figure that out if they're going to go into a play-in game because this, to me, tonight had play-in vibes. And that was another takeaway that I had from the 108 to 106 Warriors loss. But Evan Giddings with you on Warriors wrap up on 95 7 the game. If you want to react to what Steve Kerr said after the game, if you want to react to what you saw tonight in Dallas, the first loss in the last seven games for the Golden State Warriors, they looked like they were playing their best basketball, but they ran into a Mavericks team that is also playing their best basketball. Did you like what you see? Did you feel like they missed an opportunity to gain ground in the West? Did you feel like they missed an opportunity to beat a team without their best player? I want to hear from you, 888-957-9570. Jerry's hanging out in Bayview. Thanks for hanging on, Jerry. What do you got? You're on Warriors Wrap-Up. Uh, hey, Evan. Thanks for taking my call. Um, you know, the Warriors, well, you know, when they were when they were the powerhouse, you know, they'd pick out those teams and they rest their, their best players against. And now we are that team. We are the team mm. that other teams rest their star players against. And, you know, it's it's a tough pill to swallow. But I just don't think us resting our guys trying to be fresh for, you know, one game possibly that we could get knocked down on um, makes sense. I think we need to build mem- uh, momentum. And we have not played well in in Los Angeles. So, I mean, if mm. if we are going to make a run in a playoff, I think we really need to show it now. Uh, thanks for taking my call. Thanks, Jerry. Appreciate it. No, I, yeah, I, I think I'm with you. Like, I don't necessarily, well, I don't expect the Warriors to just punt, you know, on, <laughs> on a few of these games. I do think that that Lakers game will determine how they look at the rest of the week. Because if you lose in Los Angeles, well, then you're, you're, you're done. Like, you're, you are going to be the 10 seed. And I guess from the Houston perspective tonight, you know, you could have put them away and at least guaranteed yourself uh, a 10 seed. But, yeah, I think the Warriors will will trot out their traditional lineup, assuming health on Sunday, which they didn't have tonight. And then the Lakers, they're absolutely going to go for um, because of the tie-breaking scenario with, with the Lakers. But again, like I said before the break, there is a scenario in which the Warriors have the tiebreaker over the Lakers and are still the 10 seed. And that's why tonight hurts. Because you had a massive opportunity to gain ground on not one, not two, but three teams ahead of you in the Western Conference. And where I look at the Warriors really exercising effort and pushing themselves in these last five games, which they've had to pretty much do. I mean, they've been in a sprint, it seems like, since the end or the uh, coming out of the All-Star break. That, in my mind, was always with the idea that you didn't have to play two win-or-go-home elimination games. Now, the sixth seed was always in the back of people's minds, but to me, that was a little bit of a pipe dream just because of how many teams you would have to jump. The Warriors have not been able to jump one team. I know at some point, I think after they beat the Lakers in Los Angeles a few weeks ago, uh, they had... They had the inside track to the nine, but then they ran into the Knicks, who beat them on that Monday, and then they lost to the Pacers. They lost three of four. So, you know, the the Warriors have always, unfortunately, put themselves in a position because they're at 1.19 and 24. They were five games below 500 to where they have to take, it seems like, four steps forward, whereas one team is just going to have to take two or a team ahead of them just has to not fall three steps back. Like, the Pelicans have lost four games in a row. They still have an inside track on the seven seed, and they give themselves two cracks to get into the playoffs. The Warriors are, are just are continuously fighting uphill because of the slow start they had to this season, and it feels like 
they're unfortunately reaping what they've sowed with how poorly they started the first half of the year. And again, they could end up, and they they more than likely will end up with more wins than last year. And last year, 44 wins got you to the six. This year, 44 wins will have you as the 10 seed. And that's just the reality of the situation. So the loss hurts because it was a tight game. It was one in which the Warriors had the final look. They could have gotten it. And a shot here, a shot there, a turnover here, a turnover there, one misplay, that swings the game. I think that's also how a play-in scenario is going to look, too. So from a broad picture standpoint, you had a chance to make up ground. In a micro sense, I also think you got a preview of the kind of effort and grit that is going to be demanded of this team to just win one play-in game. And they got to do that twice. And that's, I think, what is still preventing a lot of people from, I don't know, getting fully on board with this Warriors team. You know, perhaps digging all the way in on how far they believe they can go. The six-game win streak proved to me that defensively this team can be dangerous. And even this game tonight, if you didn't look at it from, okay, they're the 10th seed and they had the chance to gain ground and all the rest, like that was a really good game. And I thought it was a great effort from the Warriors. But unfortunately, the reality just sets in of, damn, we're still the 10. We still got to play two road elimination games just to get to a first round series. And that's really hard. And even if they get through, then they're still at a significant rested disadvantage against a team that is younger, fresher, more athletic, no matter how they slice it. And this is a Warriors team that does and has shown when it is well rested that they can respond with terrific performances, but they just haven't been given basically that opportunity or they haven't been afforded that benefit because of the position that they've been in due to injuries, suspensions, inconsistency, all the rest. And so while I want to believe that the Warriors are playing their best basketball, and actually tonight you look at the two players that they were down, a game against the Mavericks, in a way, you saw on Tuesday how Wiggins was able to not completely shut down or neutralize a player like Luka, who also wasn't out there tonight, but you saw that defensively Wiggins can be a two-way player that can be your best guy on a given night. They didn't have him. Kaminga is someone that I think against a team like Dallas tonight who just wanted to run because Luka wasn't out there. In fact, I think J.K. would have been perfect for this game tonight because he is someone that's explosive, that is quick, that can get up and down the court, and that can also stay in front of particular players. Moses Moody couldn't do that tonight. He also couldn't hit enough shots on the other side to make him a plus offensively. And I, I thought TJD got exposed a little bit at times. And that's to be expected as a rookie. And he's played really well the last six games, but he had he had a bad one. That's going to happen. Unfortunately, when you're in those type of elimination games, you're looking ahead and you have a bad game. If Curry has a bad shooting night, you're done. If multiple starting players have bad nights, you might be going home. You're not afforded the chance to lose game one and steal game two type of thing. So that's, I think, what just continues to sink into people's minds when they lose these sorts of games. I think they made up a ton of ground, and they proved that they're playing their best basketball with their six consecutive wins, which at the beginning of which also did include, you know, Kaminga. But when you lose this game, it's like all the rest of the losses or close defeats or missed opportunities or the, you know, the, the, the theme of the season, which we've heard put in our YouTube chat powered by First NorCal Credit Union, that they're almost there, but they're just not. That sort of... I don't know, consistent thought process, it just stays with you. And it's it just resurfaces every time a game like this happens. So I don't necessarily want it to take away from the effort that the Warriors displayed tonight because as you heard from Kerr, it was great. Top to bottom, I thought they got contributions even though a couple of players didn't play well. But at the end of the day, the reality is it's just another missed opportunity in a season uh, of missed opportunities. So, to me, and we'll dig into this more as we wrap this thing up here on Warriors Wrap-Up, I do want to dig into it deeper tomorrow from 9 a.m. to noon with my guy Dan Devone on Warriors this week, and I I hope that you can tune in for that because we're going to look, I think, at the big picture, but also at a couple of these big storylines for the Warriors. What's the best-case scenario for the play-in for the Warriors? Is it to be the 9? Is it to obviously get to the 8? 
But I think those things are a little dead in the water now that they couldn't win tonight. Is it a particular opponent? Is it to be well-rested? Is it to gun for these final five wins and play your best basketball going in to the play-in tournament or the play-in game? That's, I think, what we're going to dig into most over the three hours tomorrow morning, again, from 9 a.m. to noon on Warriors this week. So a big thank you to everyone that's called in tonight, everyone that's texted on the Comcast Business text line, everyone that's chimed in on the YouTube chat and Twitch, powered by First NorCal Credit Union. A big thank you to Sterling Bennett, our program director and coordinator here at 95.7 The Game. Big thank you to Mark Grandy, who is hanging out tonight. Our guy Ken Luttrell, who is also around doing some work getting us some sound, helping us get set up and deliver this show to you here on a Friday night. I know it's a lot for maybe some of you to watch this game. Stick with us. We appreciate the conversation. We appreciate everyone tuning in here. My name is Evan Giddings saying so long after the Warriors lose to the Mavericks 108-106, to but we'll be right back at it tomorrow morning. Lock in on Warriors this week. Dan Devone, myself, will be with you on your home for Golden State Warriors basketball 95-7 the game. In the meantime, have a wonderful rest of your Friday night. Take it easy. Drive safe. Don't get too crazy. We'll talk to you tomorrow morning. Thank you very much. I have diabetes. I'm at risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. I have asthma. I'm at risk, too. If you're 19 or older with chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, COPD,